study. Please share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 13. And it reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you that is the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Someone may be listening to me tonight who have not accepted Christ as their personal Savior. The first step is to just come. You don't want to leave this earth without accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. And with the way things are going in this world, we just never know when it's going to be our last day on this earth. We can take nothing for granted. The scripture says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our song says, come, come to Jesus. Come, come. He is waiting with arms wide open. Come, all you have to do is just come to Jesus. Make the first step. Just come.
God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we come. Lord, we honor you, we praise you, we thank you again, Father God, for giving us the privilege to come before you. Lord, Father God, we thank you for being good and being God. We honor you tonight. We glorify you. We magnify you. We worship you tonight, Father God, for you are worthy. You are holy. Father God, we thank you for just being good and being God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us on tonight as we study your word. We ask you to forgive us for our, our sins, that nothing will stand between us, your voice, and your word, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to bless every hearer, bless every person that will listen later, that they will receive this word, Father God, that their lives will be made the better, that old habits will be thrown away, old burdens will be rolled away, and that we will be better than we are today. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on to Jesus. Come on, come on to him. Jesus is waiting. Yes, he is. You ought to come. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on to Jesus. Come on to Jesus. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting with arms wide open. So come on to him. He is waiting. Jesus is. Yes. Come on. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord tonight. Thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We are excited again to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we are tonight. And uh, we are at the final pericope known as the conclusion or the ending. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 is where we are tonight. The apostle Paul is still talking He's still admonishing the church of Thessalonica. The apostle Paul is still giving them directions and his message in this chapter is to remain firm in what God has blessed us and how he has blessed them with the word of God. Let's look at verse six, verses 16 and 17. Then we'll go back and see how we got here. The apostle Paul closes out chapter two. And as he closes out chapter two, he says in verse 16, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Let me stop a moment and thank uh, Brother Whitlock for carrying on on last week for, for being a part and teaching us from the Word of God on last week. So verse 16, verse 17 are, are the two verses where we are. And he says, <clears throat> Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The, salute, the, the, solution, the salutation of Paul with my own hands, which I sign every epistle, so I write. Verse 18, final word, says, grace of, may the grace of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you all. Amen. It's a different, slightly different reading from the King James Version. So the Apostle Paul is saying here, we have a Lord of peace. This Lord of peace, as we know, is Jesus Christ. And he, he concludes this particular chapter by saying, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace. He recognizes Jesus Christ as the Lord of peace. And this word peace here is a word that really, really gets our attention. And it gets our attention in such a way that we are blessed of what God is doing. Let's look at verses 16 through 17 of chapter 2. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the closing verses. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, in our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, and good hope and grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you 
in every good word and work. So he closes out chapter two by admonishing them because he's talking to them about maintaining the faith. Second Thessalonians chapter two, he deals with some things that gets us to this point. Verse 16, may the, the Lord God, Jesus Christ himself, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, he admonishes them to make sure that they understand that he is giving credit, first of all, to Jesus Christ and then to the, the Lord God himself. So again, he says to, to us that he puts Jesus Christ on the level of deity. He puts him on the same level. And we've said on several occasions that Jesus Christ is deity. We've said on several, several occasions that we believe in the Trinity of Jesus, the Trinity of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he points out the two in verse number 16, God the Father, God the Son. He points those two out. And then he moves on to talk about consolation, the comfort. And there he recognizes God the Holy Spirit. Let's look and see. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and, and Father who is, who has loved us and given us an everlasting consolation. This word consolation is comfort. He has given us an everlasting soul lands. He has given us an everlasting comfort everlasting he's given it to us and good hope by grace may that god comfort you may that god give you favor may that god i pray i i entreat i i speak on behalf of him and i admonish you to make sure that you make sure that you know that it is god himself that is blessing and God himself can give you comfort. He says to comfort your hearts, to comfort your innermost being. He says not only to comfort your hearts, but establish you or to establish you or to make you firm. He says to confirm in your spirit, to confirm in your spirit what has been taught to you in word and in deed. In every good work, in every good word. So why would he close out this way? Let's look back and see. And I want you to, to take your pen out and we're going to go over some things in your notes that you've already gone over that led us up to this point in chapter 2. First, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17 is where we want, we want to look tonight. And I want to just summarize what the Apostle Paul says to this church at Thessalonica. First, he begins by talk, he begins by talking about concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together. He's reminding them that there will come a day that we will be raptured up as a church. There will be a gathering together of every brother and sister, whether we know them or we not. He's, he's speaking concerning them because concerning this issue because the fact of the matter is there are people who are spreading some things that are not correct. They are in error. He says concerning these things, first of all, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the son of God. He's the one who has died for us. He's the one who has made us who we are. He has given us the accreditation that we have. Jesus Christ is the one who, who sets us apart. He's the one who makes us whole. Jesus Christ is the one that we can now say that we are whole. We can now say we are righteous, not because of our righteousness, but simply because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what he has already done to us. He says, let me speak to you concerning this Jesus Christ. And he says, not only is he real, not only is he our Jesus Christ, but we're going to have a gathering with him one day. 
Paul says in 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 second or in first Corinthians chapter four that there will be a day at the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. He said, Let me speak to you concerning this fact. And he says, concerning it, I don't want you to be shaken. I don't want you to be shaken in mind. I don't want you to be troubled in your spirit. I don't want you to be troubled by the words you hear. And I don't want you to be, be troubled by the letters that have been written. What's going on here is the people of Thessalonica. The people of Thessalonica is being troubled. The people of Thessalonica are being troubled because there are people who are spreading things that are not right, that are not biblical. But Paul says, don't be shaken by this. Apostle Paul says, do not be shaken in your mind. Don't be shaken and don't be troubled in your spirit. Don't have an uneasiness. Don't be even shaken by the words that you have heard. Don't be shaken by the letters. And the reason why he says don't be shaken by the letter, because some people were writing letters and they would say that Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas wrote those letters. And they were writing letters that opposed what the Apostle Paul was saying to them. They were writing letters saying that the day of the Lord has already come. The day of the rapture has already taken place. And, and then he goes on to say to us, don't believe it. Don't be shaken by it as the day of Christ is already at hand. So number one, they have been told that the day of Christ has already taken place. And then they're being told that the day of the Lord is happening right now. Paul said, don't be shaken by that. Don't be faked out by that. He moves and says, there will be a rebellion that will take place first. He talks about the fact that there will be apostasy taking place. There will be a great falling away, falling away from the Lord, falling away from the church, falling away from the people of God. So there will be a rebellion. And in this period of rebellion, the man of lawlessness will appear. He said there will be a person, an individual of lawlessness that will appear, meaning that they will not obey the law. They won't obey the law of the land, nor will, will they obey the law of God. There will be a man known as the man of lawlessness. He will appear. There will be great rebellion, a falling away from the Lord. Paul says, but don't be deceived. That day will not take place until there's a great falling away. That day, which day? The day of the Lord. It will not take place until there's a great falling away first. And that man of sin will be revealed. The man of sin, known as the son of perdition, he will be revealed. I'm just, I'm just going back through your notes from what we've already covered. Don't be deceived. The day of the Lord has not come. Don't be deceived. Verse number three, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless there's a falling away first. The man of sin, the man of sin known as the son of perdition, also known as the son of doom, he will be revealed. God will not leave us clueless. He said, this son of perdition will be revealed before Jesus comes back. This word perdition, this word perdition in verse number three, this, this word of perdition, this word means destruction. This word means death. The son of perdition. This word perdition means waste or ruin or loss. So the son of perdition, this man of lawlessness, the one that, that follows no law, he will, he will be revealed. 
Check out what else he would do. Verse number four. This, this, same, this same man of lawlessness, the same man of doom, the same man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse number four says, he will, he, he will, he will be exposed and he will oppose and exalt himself above that which is God. In other words, anything that God supports, he will oppose. And he will exalt himself. He will lift himself even above God. He will lift himself above any person or anything that represents God. When the son of perdition is revealed, this son of lawlessness, when he is revealed, he will lift himself up. He, not only will he, he lift himself up, look a little further. Verse number four he says, anything that calls himself, that is, that is called God. He will lift himself above it. He will exalt himself. And then it says, anything that is worship. The, we worship the supreme God. This word God, theos, or theos, this word God means the supreme one. Deity himself. Can you imagine a man lifting himself up above the supreme God. Can you imagine the man lift a man, a human being, a person that is flesh and blood, lifting himself above the deity himself? Uh, above this word supreme, the, the supreme one. God lifting himself above. He will oppose God. He will exalt himself above God, above all that is of God, above all the people of God. And then it goes on to say, he is the adversary of God. He's God's adversary, this man of lawlessness. Paul lays this out because as we are today, we are troubled and we are bombarded by falsehood. <laughs> as we are today, there are people there are men, there are women who think themselves more highly than they ought to. And many will tell you, and we've heard it before, even from the late, the latest president before the one we have now. I can save you without a silly cross. So he says, he says he will oppose God. He will exalt himself above all that is God. He will exalt himself above God. He will exalt himself above Jesus Christ. He would exalt himself above the Holy Spirit because he is God's adversary. He is God's opponent. He opposes the true and the living God. The Apostle Paul says to this church at Thessalonica, as I say to you tonight, the son of perdition the man of lawlessness will raise himself up even above God and he will oppose everything against. He will oppose everything that represents the true and the living God. He is the one who shall be worshipped. He will make sure that he's the one worshipped. Can you imagine worshipping a man? Can you imagine worshipping flesh and blood? Jesus says, God is a spirit, and he that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus didn't say God is flesh and blood, and if you're going to worship God, you got to worship this flesh and blood. But there are some people, even today, bowing down to flesh and blood. He's the one who is, who is and shall be worshipped. He's going he's gonna to tell people this. Look at it. He will sit in the temple of God. He will sit. He will sit. He will sit. He will sit in the temple. He will sit in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. This word showing means that he will, he will be accredited. He will be given the title. He will be given the authority. He will act like he's God. He will, he will, tr he, people will trust him as if he was God. 
and he's going to ravish in the moment. He's going to relish in the moment that people are worshiping me as if I'm a God. He is the son of perdition. He is the man of lawlessness. He will sit in the temple. Look at what it says. He will sit in the temple. He will sit in the temple. He will sit in the temple. He will sit in the temple of God. In verse number five, the apostle Paul says to them, he says, do you remember that I told you these things? Do you remember that when I, when I spoke to you, I told you these? And it's still, it's still relevant. In verse number six, he says, he says, and now you know what is restraining that he is being revealed in his own time. In other words, he's being held back. He's being, he, God has a time for this man of lawlessness to be revealed. He is going to be revealed in his own time. Everybody has a time. The senior saint says it like this. You can do whatever you want to do in the dark. It will come to the light. Amen. So he will be revealed. He will be revealed. God will reveal him. Paul says, remember I told you. He, he goes on to say, not only will he be revealed in his own time, this mystery of lawlessness is at work even right now. This mystery, verse number seven, this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. In other words, things are already going on. The foundation has already been laid. Lawlessness is all around us. And when I talk about lawlessness, I'm talking about there is a time where men and women will not obey the sound truth of God. It is here. It is this day. It is going on right now. And you don't have to look far to see it. So this mystery of lawlessness is at work and it's at work right now. God is constraining it. Verse number seven is at work right now. But there's one who restrains it. There's one who restrains him. As bad as things are right now, guess what? It's going to get worse. As, as evil as people are right now, when the son of perdition is revealed, it will even get worse. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We just see a glimmer of it right now. He is being restrained. He is being held back. He is being hindered. He's being restrained. Who's restraining him? Jesus Christ is restraining him. Jesus Christ is restraining him. He, he, he's going to sit in the temple. He's going to show himself to be God. Paul says, remember I told you? And he says, he is going to be revealed in his own time. But there's somebody, not something, there's somebody restraining him. He is being restrained. He's being held back. Verse number eight. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord Jesus Christ will destroy the son of perdition he will destroy the man of lawlessness with the breath of his mouth. He will move him out the way with the breath of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is coming back. And when Jesus Christ comes back, he going to remove this man of sin. He's going to remove this son of perdition. He's going to remove the one who is lawless. Let's look further. Verse number nine. The coming of the lawless one is in accordance with the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. 
I didn't know what the senior saints back home were talking about when they said the devil is a line wonder. So it says here that Jesus Christ will destroy him. The coming of the lawless one is in accordance with the working of Satan. In other words, the devil doesn't work against itself. The devil doesn't work against, and his little imps are busy making sure that the devil's agenda is carried out. The lawless one supports the devil's agenda. And he's going to support it, and it's going to be seen with signs, power, and wonders. The power will be there. The signs will be there. The lying wonders will be there. And it goes further to say unrighteousness and deception will be present. <laughs> the lawless one supports his master's agenda. Do you support your master's agenda? Can your master depend on you to support his agenda? Folks said, oh, the devil is sure enough he is busy. The question is, are you busy working for the Lord? Can the Lord depend on you? Is the Lord word and work going forth because of you? Are you just sitting back saying the devil sure is busy? Are you praying about it? Are you working on it? Are your words <laughs> supportive of what Jesus Christ would have us to do and say? He says here that the lawless one supports the agenda of the devil. He supports the agenda of Satan. And he supports it so well until he's able to do, he has, he, he's able to show power. He's able to show wonders. He's able to show signs. He shows it by way of unrighteousness and by way of deception. So this devil has an agenda and his, his agenda is being carried out. And when the son of perdition shows up on the scene, he will even carry it out more and more. The question is, can the Lord trust you with his word? Can he trust you with his work? Can he trust you with his worship? So the apostle Paul reminds them that the devil's agenda is being carried out now. It's already here. But when the son of perdition, the, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin appears, he's going to be revealed. God's is, God is going to take him out by Jesus' breath and Jesus' brightness at his coming. Let's look further. He says in verse number nine, he's coming, the lawlessness is coming, the lawless one is coming, and he's working for the devil. Verse number 10, and with all unrighteousness and deception among those who are perishing, those who will perish. And it goes on to say, those who are perishing, they are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth and they did not, they did not accept Jesus Christ to be saved. They did not receive, this word love is agape type love, unconditional love. God has given us unconditional love. It is the truth. They will perish because they didn't believe in the truth. They didn't believe in the truth of God because they did not take, take the truth and believe it. But they took pleasure in unrighteousness. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. They took pleasure in deception. Therefore, they're, they're going to perish because they did not receive the, the love of truth. They did not receive it, and therefore they may not be, they will not be saved. The, the verse says that they might be saved. In other words, God has a way of blessing us in our way. Our ultimate way of being blessed is through salvation. But because they don't believe the truth, they won't be blessed with salvation. Let's look further. Verse number 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong, a strong delusion. God will send them strong delusion 
that they should believe the lie. Remember in, in Romans chapter 1, God says that he will get so tired of sin until he will turn them over to a reprobate mind. You remember how God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Well, even if Pharaoh wanted to let the people go, God hardened his heart where he wouldn't do it so that these plagues would take place and demand that he let them go. Such it is here. God will send them a strong delusion, a strong deception. In other words, they will be so deceived until they will continue down that road of unrighteousness. That they may perish, that they will perish because they didn't believe the truth, but they took value, they took pleasure in unrighteousness. <laughs> they took value and pleasure in unrighteousness, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure, verse number 12, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you take pleasure in unrighteousness or do you want to do what's right? Paul says, even as a born again saved person, one who reveals, one who, who trusts in Jesus Christ, who reveals Jesus Christ, Paul says in Romans chapter seven, every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. I want to do what's right. I would like to do what's right. I try to do what's right. My question to you today, are you looking to do unrighteousness or righteousness? Is God's program being revealed in you or is the devil agenda being revealed in you? I look at people sometimes, I'm like, whoo. The devil is busy. <laughs> we ought to have our minds, our hearts set on getting God's agenda out to other people. The question tonight, are you working in unrighteousness or are you working in righteousness? Verse number 13, the comfort of the believer is sure on the day of the Lord. But verse number 13, Paul says, brothers and sisters, we are bound. Meaning that we are obligated to thank God for you. <laughs> my brothers and my sisters, let me just share with you tonight. We have an obligation to each other. And the first obligation, other than sanctification and salvation, sanctification, the next obligation is that we are obligated, we are bound by God to give God thanks for each other. When was the last time you thanked God for your fellow brother and sister in Christ? When was the last time you encouraged your brother and sister in Christ? When was the last time that you just bowed down on your knees secretly and just thank God for your brother and sister. I'm telling you, you ought to be thanking God for a righteous spouse. You ought to be thanking God for a righteous child or children. You ought to be thanking God for a righteous pastor or preacher. You ought to be thanking God not only for the preacher, but also for fellows, brothers, and sisters. Lord, thank you for the household of faith. You ought to thank God because we're obligated. The Apostle Paul said we're bound. We are obligated to thank God for you. Look at what he says. We're obligated to thank God for you. We are bound to thank God for you. Always we thank God for you. From the beginning, God chose you. From the beginning, God has chosen you. God can see far farther than we can. So God saw us today before we were born. And because God saw us today before we were born, God chose us. We didn't choose God. As a matter of fact, regardless of how much evangelism we do, how much preaching and teaching we do, it takes the Holy Spirit to draw one to Christ. And God draws one to Christ because God saw fit before we were born. Look at what it says. It says 
God chose you. Verse number 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you. My, my beloved brethren, by Lord Jesus Christ, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. We can't even come to Christ. We can't even get to heaven. We can't even get to know God without God choosing us. God has chosen us. I'm so glad God chose me. God chose me. God has chosen you. God is choosing others, but he's already done it. He did it in eternity past. God chose us. He chose us for salvation. But look what he says, through sanctification by the spirit. There's the third person of the triune God by the spirit and belief in the truth. Now, people talk about predestination all the time, saying that, that God chooses you and you don't get to choose yourself. But look at what it says. God chooses us. God has chosen us through sanctification. Sanctification, right living, holy living, set apart by the Spirit. The Spirit of God chooses us. The Holy Spirit chooses us and the belief in the truth. In other words, you got to believe the truth. You have to believe in the Son. The next verse will tell us. The next verse says, to which he called you by our gospel. The Apostle Paul says, we've taught the gospel to you. we preached the gospel to you. He says it in 1 Thessalonians. He says it in 2 Thessalonians. He said it over and over again in Romans. He's saying this is the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe on this gospel. He has chosen you to which he called you by the gospel. Oftentimes during my teachings in evangelism, students try to tell me how they were saved. And as they tell me how they are saved, I tell them, if you were saved by any means other than trusting Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, you are not saved. If you were born again by any means other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are not born again. If you think you're going to heaven by any means other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will not see heaven. If you're going to be saved by any means other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let me share with you, let me tell you, you will not be saved. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone, and he offers it to everybody. God chooses us, and as God has chosen us, we, our commitment is to trust the story, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is our commitment to trust the story. As we trust the story, we are born again. Verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, God has blessed us to be saved. It's an honor. It's even an honor to be thought of by God. It is an honor to be blessed by God. It is an honor to be saved by God. It is an honor to be sanctified by God. I listen to people and they say something like, I'm, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and woo, I'm filled with his precious Holy Ghost. And they say it as if they did something to get there. I'm telling you, we cannot do anything to be born again. We cannot do anything to be sanctified except we do it through Jesus Christ. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, through faith in him. It is grace, something we never deserve. I don't care how holy you have been in the last 10 years. The fact of the matter is you cannot be born again without Jesus Christ. And then when you talk about being holy or being sanctified or set apart, you cannot be saved, sanctified, and set apart. You cannot be holy except through Jesus Christ. 
So we can't brag. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine tells us there's nothing we can brag on. That's, that we can shout about it, but we must brag on Jesus and what he did on Calvary. Because mm -hmm. we didn't do anything. It's what he has done on Calvary. Only thing we can do is trust. And as we trust him, he saves us. As we continue to trust him, he sanctifies us, makes us holy, set apart. And the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. And then Paul says in Romans again, he says, and God even gave you the faith. He says, God gave unto every man a measure of faith. So the faith doesn't belong to us. The grace doesn't belong to us. It all goes by God. It is through God, from God, by way of Jesus Christ. It says, now we have attained glory. We have obtained honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is an honor to have the big brother, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the deity himself on our side. Other folk may not be on your side, but when you have Jesus on your side, you can get to go to heaven. Verse 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. You're being taught the traditions. And I'm not talking about the traditions as we talk about in church. I'm not talking about the mission is always on fifth Sunday. I'm not talking about the fifth Sunday choir is always the mission choir. I'm not talking about uh, we always wear white on this Sunday, yellow on this Sunday, red on that Sunday. Not that's tradition. <clears throat> I'm not even talking about we have to come up and put a chair out for people to come down the aisle to be saved. Those are just that, traditions. But I'm talking about the Apostle Paul saying to them, hold on to the, the traditions of the word. I want our church to, to maintain certain traditions and get rid of others. We want to maintain the tradition or the custom of reading the word of God listening to the word of God and journaling the word of God that we might live by the word of God. You have to know the word in order to live the word. We can't live the word unless the word is in us. We can't even know the word unless the word is in us because these are some tough times. And because these are some tough times, we need to understand the devil is busy and the devil will try us and the devil will succeed if we don't know the word. When you look at Matthew chapter three and Matthew chapter four, Jesus is being tempted after he was fasting for 40 days. The devil comes to us just like he came to Jesus at our weakest moments. But every single time Jesus says that it is written, we must know what is written in the word of God. We must, set, we, must, we must saturate ourselves with the word. That's why our church is listening to the word daily. Thank you so much. That's a good place to clap right there. We are listening to the word daily and we are journaling what we hear and we are making sure that we study the word daily by reading the word and studying it daily. That's the only way we can be strong. When I see attitudes... I know who's been listening to the word. And when I see attitudes, I know who has been reading and studying the word. I don't have to look at your notebook. I don't have to see your journal, but I can look at the way you react under certain pressures. And some of the stuff you're reacting to is not even pressure. I mean, my goodness, is it, is it, is it that juvenile to you? And are you that juvenile? that you haven't read the word where it says, he that has no control over his own spirit is like a city whose walls are torn down, in and everything can come in and have its way. We are in control when we read and study the word of God. We are in control even in the midst of disasters. We ought to be able to walk in a room where there's just a storm going on and be calm and just helm things. Today, I was in one of the greatest danger in a long time. I'll talk about it later on. 
But the guy that was with me said, man, you were cool, calm, and collected. Because I wasn't dependent on me. I was dependent on God. Mm -hmm. When you study the word, you read the word, you believe the gospel, and you believe the word of truth, you can be cool and calm under pressure. And realize it's not about you. So you have to maintain those traditions which has been taught, which have been taught to you, whether in word or in epistle, whether in word or writing, whether in work or word. You gotta hold on to it. Stick with it. Don't go off to college and come back a Muslim. Don't go off to college and come back a Mormon. You are a Christian. The word Christian means Christian. The word Christian means Christ-like. We are Christians. We are like Christ. We handle storms the way Christ handled storms. Yes, sir. Look what he says. He says, whether in word, by word or our epistle, our writing. Verses 16 and 17. And this is where we started. This is where we complete this particular chapter and say to you that the Apostle Paul is saying, don't be shaken. He says, he says, verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, nobody but Jesus, and our Father, and our God and Father, nobody but Jesus and God the Father, who has loved us. This word love is agape love. It is an unconditional love. Jesus God the Son, God, God the Father, have loved us so much that he's given us unconditional love. He has granted us, he has loved us unconditionally and given us everlasting constellation. How much constellation? Everlasting. How much is everlasting? From now on, he has given us everlasting constellation. He has given us a perpetual, this word, Everlasting means perpetual, meaning that it's continuing and it keeps growing on and on and on. It's everlasting, eternal. It is past time and it is future time. It is everlasting consolation. He gives us everlasting. This word consolation is exaltation. It is comfort. He has given us everlasting comfort. And he's given us good hope. He's given us good hope, and he's not only given us good hope, he's done it by grace. This word hope is anticipation. We ought to have a great anticipation. We ought to have faith. This word hope means that, that faith is, is what we ought to have that takes us into an arena that no one can go into unless they're born again. Our mindset, our heart, our, we anticipate what God is going to do. It is, it is confidence in God. We hope in God. Stop putting your hope in people. Hope in God. And we do it by, by grace. And that is God's favor, God's acceptance, God's liberation, God's pleasure. We do it by God's pleasure. We do it because God has favored us. Finally, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that this comforts your heart. I pray that this exalts you. This word comfort means that, that it, it exalts you. It, it invites you to come closer to God. It, it is, it is, it is the, the word that means to call, to call near and to come near. God wants us to draw near to him. He will draw near to us if, he, if we draw near to him. He said he wanted you, your hearts to be comforted. And hearts here means your feelings, your innermost beings, your thoughts. Don't you want God to comfort you? Don't you want your thoughts lined up with God and trust him? And establish you in every good work every good word and work. God wants to establish you or establish you. This word means confirmation. I have the confirmation in the assurance that God living works. I have the assurance that God living will work 
even under pressure. You see, the people at the, the saints at Thessalonica was under pressure. They were listening to heresy. The Apostle Paul says, hang in there. He says, stay established, stay firm, stand firm. Therefore, stand steadfast. And when you do it, keep up the good work and keep up the good word. In other words, your utterance, your words, your deeds, your work. He says, keep it up. He says, this is what's going to establish your every good work, your every good word. Stick with the Lord. Don't let stuff outside trouble you. Don't let heresy come in. Don't let false doctrine, doctrine come in. It says, whatever you do, stand firm. Whatever you do, stand for the Lord. Whatever you do, stay with the Lord. There may be somebody listening to me tonight who has not trusted Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know him. Will you trust him today? Apostle Paul says, trust the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you trust the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are saved. As you're saved, God welcomes you to heaven. Will you trust him tonight? It's a very simple thing that you can do. Just believe that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took a tree, gave his life on that tree. Jesus Christ was taken off the tree and buried in a tomb. Thank God it was a borrowed tomb. Just believe that Three days later, he rose from the dead. And you can be saved right here, right now. Will you join me in prayer and invite Jesus, life, Jesus Christ into your life to make you a new person? And he will do it right now. Whether you listen to this broadcast live or whether you will be listening to it in memorex or later. Join me in prayer and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you really prayed this prayer, trusting the death, burial, and resurrection to save you, we believe that you're now born again. We believe that you're going to heaven. We believe that you are saved. There may be others who struggle with sin like all of the rest of us do. I pray that the Lord bless you to turn back to him. You are saved and know that you are. But for some reason or the other, you keep going and back and forth. I pray that the Lord bless you. I pray that the Lord strengthen you. I pray that the Lord encourages you. There may be others who, who are in between church homes. You need a church home. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. Wolves have nests. Those things are their homes. Everybody need a place that they can come to and call home. Every individual needs a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus Christ is the center of attention and the main attraction. Will you trust him today and trust in him at the New Beginning Church? You can join distantly or you can join locally. Our service is at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday. We'd like for you to be a part of it. We ask for you to come and be a part of our, our services so you can be blessed. 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for being a part of the New Beginning Church Bible Study. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through prayer and through giving. It is time to give to the Lord financially. Father God, we thank you now for this privilege of prayer. We thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless us now as we come to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. You can give by two means. You can mail your offering to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can send your offering electronically by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea here is as we lift Jesus, he draws all men unto himself. Again, our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Again, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our services on tonight. In our prayer time, we will be praying for Lydia and Darrington. We'll be praying for Rasheen, Maryland, and family. We will be praying for Lula Richard. We will be praying for Sister Ari Warner. And we'll be lifting up in bereavement the Gaza family and the Brenda family. Please continue to pray for these and keep them in your prayer as we move forward. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for our offering. We thank you for our, uh, our gifts through finances. We thank you for our sacrificial gifts. We thank you for our love gifts. Now, Lord, we pray, Father God, that you bless us. Bless the Darrington family, Sister Lydia Darrington. Bless the Maryland family. Bless the rich sister Lula Richard. Bless Sister Warner. And bless the Branda family as well as the Gargo family. We ask you to lift them. We ask you to encourage them. We ask you, Father God, to bless them. Now, Lord, we thank you for this privilege. Unto you, Father God, we, we thank you. Unto you we give you glory. Unto you we give you honor. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and true God. Unto him be glory and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing by by saying, Amen, Amen, and Amen. God bless you and God keep you. Look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at the New Beginning Church. You can tune in at this station or many of our members' stations on Facebook Live. Thank you so much. And you can go also to our website. Our website is NBC Souls. Dot org, nbcsouls.org. Thank you again. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.